please introduce yourself? I'm Susan Steinberg and I'm a dog behavioral trainer in Dallas, Texas. Hello Susan, could you tell us a little bit about the history of herding dogs? Uh, I'd really be interested in knowing when people started keeping and using herding dogs to herd livestock. Uh, as far as livestock goes, uh, people don't really know. There isn't a very large written history about herding animals. Up until the 19th century when the British aristocracy decided to start cataloging all the pedigrees of their, of their dogs and their livestock, that's when we started finding out about uh, certain breeds which were tied to certain families in certain regions. Before that it wasn't cataloged, but it is dated back to over 10,000 years that people used animals for herding purposes, for hunting, uh, you know, for, for herding livestock and all that. There's just no specific date on when the livestock part started happening. What were the first herding breeds and when did they come about? Uh, the first herding breeds, as far as being documented, again, there were three of them that all happened in the late 19th century. There was a man in Scotland who bred a bunch of different uh, dogs together to create his perfect uh, herding dog and that became the Border Collie. And then in America, we, there were the sheep herding back in the 19, late 19th century was a huge thing. The Bosque actually came over and they brought their dogs with them, which are the Australian Shepherd, which is a misnomer. It was a historical mistake to name them Australian Shepherds. They actually were from the Bosque region, uh, but that is where the Australian Shepherd came from. So they were herding dogs and or herding, you know, sheep and cattle in America. And then we also have the Australian cattle dog, also known as the Red Healers and the Blue Healers. And there was a man in Scotland who brought his dog over, or his dogs over, which were sort of the foundation of the Australian cattle dog. He brought them from Scotland to Australia. And then as his story and history kind of tells, he bred them with the dingo, which is the natural wild dog of Australia. And that became the uh, Australian cattle dog we know today. What are the four main herding groups and what jobs do they perform? Uh, the four main her herding groups, uh, basically for specific herding, you have headers and footers. Footers drive from the back, headers control from the front. You also have tending dogs, uh, which are like the German Shepherds or tending dogs. They uh, keep livestock in line, moving from pasture to pasture. They keep them from going into the road. Uh, they also keep them from eating valuable crops. Um, and they do that by actually using their bodies to push onto the sheep. And then you also have the guardian dogs, like the Mastiff, that actually watch over the flocks and uh, keep them safe from predators. I've heard that herding dogs made it possible for humans hundreds of years ago to live in certain places that would normally be uninhabitable. Is that true? Uh, that question's subjective. Um, maybe what you and I would call uninhabitable, others wouldn't. But the main thing is, um, it's, it definitely, if you're going back 10,000 years, it, it's allowing people to hunt in a way that they couldn't hunt before because they're using dogs to corral prey so that they have a better shot at killing them. So it made, uh, it made humans living in what you would say uninhabitable environments much easier. And for when you just come to the herding part in the more modern day centuries, uh, you're dealing with people that are living on thousands of miles of open land. So how do you drive herds from one place to another? And that's where animals came to be. They were much cheaper to use than humans. You know, it's just dog food, not, not pay. <laughs> so Susan, are herding dogs a good type of dog for the first time owner? Are herding dogs a good type of dog for the first time owner? Uh, I would suggest not. They require an exceptional amount of uh, physical and mental activity, which a first time dog owner is not going to be familiar with. It's certainly better to start with a, a dog or a breed that is a little bit lower key so that you can get used to owning an animal and not start at the top echelon of intelligence and needs from an animal. What type of dog should they consider? Well, I mean, you can, 
any type of dog is possible for a human, but you have to, you have to remember with it in any dogs are dogs first, and then they have traits of what, whatever they were bred for. But within any breed, there is always going to be a dog that is good for you. But if you don't know how to pick out that animal, you're going to have a problem. Like for example, most people go to the dog that's really excited because they think, Oh my God, this dog loves me. In reality, that's just a very excitable, dominant dog, which is, if you're a first time dog owner, it's going to be way too much for you to handle. So you want to go for the calmer dogs that are sort of in the back and not coming straight at you. You also don't want to go for a fear-based dog, but somewhere in the middle, you know, not all the way in the back of like, let's say you have a pack of puppies. So not the one that's all the way in the back and not the one that's crawling all over you. Just find, look at one and see which one is calm amidst all of the crazy that's going on when, when you're looking at dogs, no matter where you are, that's the perfect dog for a first time dog owner. Are there any herding breeds that are good with small children? Yeah, uh, really any of them can work well with small children. I would say with the exception of the Australian cattle dog, um, they are very intense and their way of herding is nipping, which can hurt, you know, small children. Um, they are also pretty much tireless and children scream and they move, which herding dogs react to. Uh, so Australian cattle dogs really for kids under the age of 10 are not recommended because your children have to be able to listen to you and understand if the dog nips you, correct him. If the dog's overexcited, correct him. Children under the age of 10 aren't going to be able to do that. So really any dog, as long as you're willing to put the work in, because again, with any of the herding dogs, they can make beautiful, lovely family members. But if you don't put that mental and physical training in, you will have a dog that is going to have behavioral issues, which can be dangerous for kids. Are there any common challenges with trying to make a breed that is usually kept in the country into a city dog? Yes, there are definitely challenges with keeping what would typically be a country dog, you know, in an urban environment. Uh, but that goes right back to the mental and physical training. If you satisfy their needs, they are, they are working dogs. They have a, they were bred to have a job and they're incredibly intelligent. So if you do not satisfy their mental needs and also their physical needs on a daily basis, again, you'll see behavioral issues. Do behavioral and personality tendencies differ between the four main herding groups? Yeah, sure. There are different, you know, behavioral tendencies before, between the different breeds that are used for herding. Um, again, a dog of, you can have five dogs of the same breed and they're all going to have different personalities. So it's really about choosing the dog that has the correct personality for your home. If you're highly active and you're out all the time, get the high energy dog. If you want a dog to chill, really getting a herding dog or working breed dog isn't going to work for you because they really require a lot more attention than, than a lot of other breeds do. Hi, I'm Dennis Simmons. This is my wife, Marge. This is our Border Collie Mix buddy. Tell me a little bit how, about how you acquired Buddy. Well, Buddy was my mother's dog. Um, she lived, uh, she and my father lived on a uh, uh, farm, two and a half acres with a three story farmhouse. And my dad gave a Buddy to her for a Christmas present one year. And uh, he lived with her for about 10 years. And then she, uh, she moved to another house. And then she said she was going to go to assisted living. So we had always told her when she got ready to go to assisted living that Buddy could come live with us. And so that happened Mother's Day. What, uh, five years ago, mm -hmm. a little over five yeah. years ago. What did you do to prepare Buddy for city living? Uh, well, since my mother only gave us, what, about two weeks notice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> there wasn't a lot that we did to actually prepare other than, you know, get a crate and, you know, think about the things that we needed to do. Um, he, but, had, he had visited before, so he knew and he stayed with us for short lengths of time. So he was familiar with the surroundings, which I think helped him a, a little bit. But um, other than that, I think we were going in a little bit blind because at the time we really didn't even know what his breed, you know, what his breed was. We just weren't familiar with it. Were there any particular skills that you needed to teach him for when he came here? 
Well, he, he was accustomed to uh, the two and a half acres, and then my mother moved to another house, had a very large backyard. So he was used to being out outside in the backyard, running around, had pretty much all day, every day. He could come in and go out, that sort of thing. So we have a relatively small backyard, so it was a matter of uh, him adjusting to the physical space. But uh, we figured out pretty quickly that he needed a lot of exercise. And so you took him for walks, what, three, four, five times a day? <laughs> yes. How much weight did you lose? 15 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. On a scale of one to 10, uh, how much exercise did he need? As far as uh, distance and time length goes. 11 or 12? Uh, no, I would say definitely at the high end of the, the scale, you know, eight, nine, 10. Uh, because that he he uh, he didn't get walked a lot, but he did have that room to run. So the walks that we took him on kind of took place of having all that room to roam, and so and he really enjoyed his walks. So we would probably walk at least a mile three or four times a day. And uh, how did you make sure Buddy got enough mental stimulation throughout the day? He, he makes sure that he does, he's, he's very helpful with that, but he has uh, two huge baskets of toys and he doesn't just wanna play fetch. He wants to be challenged in his toy playing. So I have I actually get down on the floor with him and kind of invent um, games that we play hockey with his hamburger, which is kind of, a, it's a hard plastic toy and he'll get down and of course he does the, you know, down on the floor and I try and get it past him or if he does go out to catch a toy, he's back over, looking over his shoulder so he can catch it. He just, you know, he yeah, just he, doesn't want to run, bring a toy back, go get a toy if, and bring it back. If you toss a ball out for him to like go fetch the ball, he go, he turns around and looks at him, he's like, what? You know, yeah. this is yeah, too, yeah, I, I know how to do what this What am I supposed though. to do with that? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Were there any other games that you found helpful? Well, hmm. hmm. Well, when, when, I mean, no, we, I can't. I don't think so. But when we were on walks, we would we would let him charge and take off after squirrels and, and birds. Uh, he he loves to chase the birds and flush them and you know that sort of thing. Sounds like he's having a lot of fun here. <laughs> he is, and we are. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the most important part. What approach would you recommend? herding dog owners who are transferring their dogs from the country to the city take? Well, I, I think it's really understanding um, the environment that they're coming from. Uh, if, they were, if they were just let it, if they were able to just stay outside most of the time uh, in an urban environment, obviously that isn't going to work. You've got to, you know, they've got to be protected. You've got alleyways, sidewalks, driveways cars going up and down the street and that sort of thing. So having that awareness of uh, traffic and other things, is, it, but that was, a, that was a bit of a transition, I think. And I would strongly suggest that this is not a good type of a, a dog to keep in a crate all day. I just don't think that that's, that's something that would be good for the dog or probably good for the owner, uh, just because there's gonna be a lot of pent up Energy, energy and I'm, I, that might come out in bad behavior. <laughs> what advice would you give someone who lives in the city who is looking to own a herding dog? Um, well my, my immediate response to that one is to, to be sure and socialize the dog as early as possible. And when I say socialize, I mean with other dogs. Um, border collies especially are notorious for being an only dog. In other words, they, they, they view other, other dogs as interlopers against their flock. And so they want to make sure that you know, they're, if they see another dog, they're very defensive about it. So if they learn as a puppy that other dogs are okay, so have, socializing them, having them understand that other dogs are not a threat, I think that's a big thing. As well. And small children. Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. Um, <laughs> nobody is really allowed to run on our street because he feels the need that they have to be herded. So. Uh, socializing with other dogs, socializing with all ages is also something I would recommend. Okay.
Okay, thank you so much for answering my questions. I really appreciate it. Hope you have a good day. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Lauren and this is Brady, my Welsh Corgi. What made you decide to become a Welsh Corgi owner? Um, we've always had Corgis. This is our third Corgi and I, um, our family has always enjoyed the Corgi breed. How did you acquire your Corgi? My mom and I uh, found him um, with a dog breeder um, near Waco. What type of herding were Welsh Corgis bred for? Pretty much um, any kind of farm animals or sheep or goats or I mean I guess any kind of animal that they like to chase. Are Corgis energetic dogs? Yes they are very energetic and he likes to run around and chase squirrels. On a 1 to 10 scale, how easy or difficult is it to keep your corgi properly exercised? Yes, I would say 10. Um, he likes to, I mean, he does like people food, but, um, we, you know, I try to keep him, uh, you know, at a pretty good, you know, weight, healthy weight for him. What does your dog's exercise routine look like? Well, I've walked him in the neighborhood before, and he does like to uh, run around in the house and chase squirrels in the backyard. What advice would you give to corgi owners who are struggling to give their corgi the exercise it needs? I would just say keep them at a healthy weight because they do have back problems, and you don't want them to have leg and hip issues. Are there any tricks or strategies you use to exercise your corgi other than walking or running him? Um, he does he does like water when I uh, um, uh, do uh, water the plants he runs around in the sprinklers but um, I've also seen um, on Facebook that uh, corgis like to swim, but also just keep them protected with like life jackets. On a one to ten scale, how easy or difficult was it to train your corgi? Um, it was pretty easy. We, my mom and I, uh, took him to a dog trainer, and she. And helped him learn to sit and stay and lay down and you know pretty much try to make sure that he you know is a well-behaved well -behaved trained dog. Were there any challenges? Um, he, sometimes he is stubborn, Corgis are stubborn that um, they like to do it their own way so I guess that could be a challenge. Were there behaviors that were easier to teach? Um, just I mean, af after the training session, um, I mean, my mom and I pretty much, you know, did try to, you know, keep what the trainer suggested so I would say um, I mean he's been a, you know a good well companion dog for, for me and finally what advice would you give to the first time corgi owner well he's definitely a good companion dog and you know I'm kind of biased of uh, corgis that I mean, I, I would say that you can, um, you know, they're they're well they're well behaved dogs. I would say. Okay, thank you so much thank for you. letting me interview you. Um, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Savannah Strange, and this is my dog, Lady. Hello, Savannah. What made you to decide? What made you decide to adopt a herding dog? 
and it wasn't more based on her breed it was more of her personality uh, she's very hyper very smart <laughs> a little too smart uh, and she's definitely shown that she can keep up with whatever we whatever's thrown at her she's always figuring new things out that's kind of the reason why I connected with her how did you acquire your dog I, I she came from the Richardson animal shelter she was a stray and the day she was up for adoption, I was there. She remembered me and we decided it was a match. What kind of herding was your dog bred for? Uh, for cattle and sheep. Um, she's never actually met one in person. Fun fact. Do any of those herding behaviors translate into your dog's daily life? Every day. Uh, she likes to herd the cats we have. Uh, and if we go out to the field or if we're at a dog park, um, she either is very dedicated on the task she is given or she will run around us if we're on a trail. She'll actually circle us uh, completely over and over as we continue to walk her circles will get bigger. Uh, and then she will cut in between us to get us to change directions just like the herding dogs, the working dogs. On a 1 to 10 scale, how energetic is your herding dog? Probably a 9. We can play for hours and she will still pass you the ball. On a 1 to 10 scale, how little or much exercise does your dog need? As much as possible. Uh, she's very good if we don't get off that day, but after if something happens and we're too busy for a couple of days, she's very hyper, very needy as much as that is the best way to say it because all she wants is she wants you to play with her um we definitely have to get her out at least twice a day minimum for at least 30 minutes each time what do you do to make sure your dog gets enough exercise fetch we play lots of fetch uh every time we go outside we have a routine she will bring her ball or bring a toy uh, and I have to convince her to potty first, and once she potties, she knows that I will throw the ball for a few minutes in return. So it's kind of in, in intermediate uh, fetch times, uh, as well as interactive toys and interactive treats to keep her, her brain working too. Are there any activities that you would recommend for herding dog owners who are having trouble with exercising their dog to their full needs? Agility training. Uh, I've seen uh, dogs that I've worked with, it does wonders to, because so herding dogs are very smart. Not only do they need the exercise, they need the mental stimulation. Uh, they can't just like go outside and run for a few hours. They need to have something that's constantly working with them. I definitely recommend lots of new, uh, teaching new tricks. Uh, definitely lots of walks. Agility training has been awesome for other dogs that I've known and just keep working with them. We learn new tricks every few weeks to keep her going. How do you make sure that your herding dog gets enough mental stimulation? We are always at PetSmart. We're always getting something new, getting something different. Uh, we're always trying to teach her new things, new, new commands. Uh, she's normally off leash. Uh, when we're away from the public eye and away from you know busy traffic and things so it's mainly of keeping her the the commands of come here stay walking with me you know don't don't go over there ignore your natural instinct to go run after that squirrel and stay right here and we just keep going with that every day it's it's a long process we've never stopped training the three years we have been together, training has never stopped. Are there any activities you would recommend herding dog owners do with their dog to make sure their pet gets enough mental stimulation? I definitely think that continually to communicate with your dog and to communicate what you want them to do, but always, you know, I'm very nice about it, so she usually will, will do it because I ask politely. If I'm in a hurry, she's not gonna wanna do anything. You got to keep that connection with your dog. You can't just think that, you know, oh, we went for a walk today. She's fine. You know, no, it's we go over all of our tricks every night before dinner uh, to get fed. She has to do her tricks, do her routine. And she's very focused. 
On a 1 to 10 scale, how easy or difficult was it to train your dog? Depends what it was. Uh, it always, it ranges. Uh, it's been super easy. Uh, is 10 the easiest? 10's the hardest. 10's the hardest. Uh, crawl was probably an 8. Teaching her to crawl because she doesn't want to stay down all the way. She kind of like half butts it. Uh, sit was super easy. I taught her that before we left the shelter. Uh, and then other things like staying in her assigned seat in the car with her seatbelt. That was about an eight because uh, she always wanted to hop back and forth. Everything else, though, uh, has been pretty easy. Probably about a four. And finally, what advice would you give to anyone who is thinking about keeping a hurting dog in the city? Make sure you have tons of time and tons of patience. Uh, herding dogs are too smart for their own good. Uh, they do get bored, they will get destructive, uh, and bad behaviors are a sign of boredom. And you gotta make sure you put in that time for your dog. If you're too busy, then a herding dog is definitely not the dog for you. I'm a very busy person, and I wasn't when I got her, but I, I'm realizing as more of my schedule continues to feel how I do need to set aside that dedicated time to make sure if I don't get her out, then if I don't, I will suffer the consequences at 1030 at night when she tries to bring me a ball when I'm trying to go to sleep. So you definitely got to make sure you get them out or you will not rest. <laughs>
giving the new owners resources to help with caring for the animal and making sure that they're aware of um, the types of behaviors that these animals have um, and just making sure that they have enough exercise and playtime and, and that kind of stuff and learning that you know these types of dogs are uh, very active and they need an active lifestyle. What makes them so adoptable? They're just a lot of fun to play with. They're very active. They, they're they just, um, you know, just playful and happy. And But again, you want to make sure that the dog gets uh, the right resources and the right training um, to be a successful uh, family um, for this dog. Are many of these dogs brought back to the shelter? I wouldn't say many of them, but upon a you know consideration uh some people may not um do their research and they adopt and then they realize that this pet is not the right fit for them and that happens quite often with just any adoption um, we try to make sure that the new adopter is aware of the needs of the pet before they go out the door with the animal um, and sometimes things just don't work out so we try our best to uh, find a new home. What would be the perfect urban home for a herding dog? Um, if the herding dog is given enough socializing and uh, Playtime. I don't see why it wouldn't thrive in an urban urban environment. A lot of people have herding type dogs or active dogs like labs and that kind of thing. Um, but again, like some trainers will tell you, you know, a, a tired dog is a good dog. So they need uh, stimulation and and playtime and that kind of thing. You can't just leave a dog like say in a backyard or at home all day long and expect that animal to um, not tear things up or act out in a destructive way. They need socializing, they need uh, training, they need to be stimulated just like we would. We wouldn't want to be left all alone all day long. Do you believe these dogs should be kept in the city? I don't why they wouldn't be good dogs for you know city dwellers they're they're I have many uh, doctors who've adopted from us and uh, they live in the urban settings and as long as they take them out for walks and you know do a lot of socializing with them then they they're happy parts of uh, their family that makes sense. Thank you so much, You're Nora, welcome. for letting us interview you. We all YouTube and everyone watching this, including me, really appreciate it. Hello, everyone. This is Cynthia. We are at Dog and Kitty City for another one of our interviews. Dog and Kitty City is a no-kill shelter who takes in, I'm sure, plenty of herding dogs. And we are here to ask Cynthia some questions. So Cynthia, about how many herding dogs and herding dog mixes does your shelter take in every year? Last year we took in 44. What condition are they usually in when they come to you? They're in pretty good condition. Um, the reason they surrender is because is they don't have enough room for them at their house. How long do they usually stay at the shelter? Um, not long, um, probably the most two months. Are herding dogs difficult to adopt? No. That's great. What makes them so adoptable? Um, people like the breed, um, the herding breed. Um, they're really smart dogs. Um, as long as they have room for them, then you know they make the best dogs. What are you looking for in a potential home for your average herding dog that comes to your shelter? We ask that they have a lot of room, um, a lot of yard. Um, they 
really, really energetic, and so they do need a lot of room to exercise because they are herding dogs. Okay, that makes sense. What does Dog and Kitty City do to try and find that kind of home? Uh, we have people put in applications first so that we can review the application. If they live in an apartment, uh, we wouldn't recommend that to them because they just don't have enough room for the herding dog. Um, but we really want them to have a yard and a pretty big, nice sized yard and maybe a friend for him too. Does your organization provide any help to people who may have adopted herding dogs from your shelter and have questions on how to meet the dog's training, energy, and behavioral needs? Yes, um, usually the most that we get asked is about them climbing the fences. Um, we do offer help with that and give them suggestions. In your opinion, what does it take to successfully keep a herding dog as a pet and keep him happy or healthy? Lots of exercise. Um, we have adopters who exercise them about an hour in the morning before they go to work and then about two or three hours after they get home. But lots of exercise. They're herding dogs so they're used to working. In your opinion, what percentage of owners achieve that? Um, the ones that we adopted, um, pretty much all of them. On a scale between 1 and 10, how easy or difficult are these dogs to keep in the city? Um, I want to say about a four um, because the city is this small. They don't really have a lot of land. Um, in the country, it has more land, more acres of land. What happens to a herding dog, let's say, that is kept in a person's apartment all day and gets no exercise or mental stimulation? He gets bored. Um, they, they're herding dogs, so they're used to working. So if he's just inside of an apartment for eight, nine hours, he gets bored. So he'll go to chewing toys, I mean, shoes, couches, you know, just stuff that belongs to the owner. Um, so, I mean, they just, that goes to where they need a yard and lots of exercise. On another note, which breed of herding dogs do you find easiest to adopt? Red healers. Are there any breeds that have recently become extremely popular to keep in the city? Red healers. Do you get any calls looking for these kinds of breeds? Um, about two to three times a week. And finally, what advice would you give to a family who is looking to adopt a herd? Um, my advice is, is to be paired to play with him. Um, walk him and just give him a lot of attention. Okay, thank you so much for letting us interview you, Cynthia. We really appreciate the information okay. that you have to offer. Thank you. In your opinion, should herding dogs be kept in the city? Uh, yeah, herding dogs can be kept in the city. Again, if you don't satisfy their mental and physical requirements, you, you'll have behavioral issues. So they can absolutely live here. But they have to be walked. They have to be physically challenged. They have to be mentally challenged. If you're the type of owner that's willing to do that, you will have a very happy dog in an urban environment. If you're not, you will have a dog with behavioral issues. What would the ideal urban environment be for a herding dog? The ideal uh, urban environment for a herding dog is definitely not an apartment. It is not an apartment animal. You really need a house with a yard, which isn't to say if you let your dog out in the yard, that's enough exercise because it's not even close. You still have to put in the physical, the actual walking every day and the mental requirements for them every day. However, when you're at home, it gives them time to work off even extra energy outside in the yard. So that's why an apartment doesn't work. About how much time goes into owning, caring for, exercising, and training your average herding dog? How much time goes into these dogs? Well, I mean, a little bit more than a lot of other dogs. Any working breed dog is gonna require extra effort. Uh, you're gonna have to walk them two hours a day minimum, hour in the morning, hour at night, that's bare minimum. And you're also gonna have to do an hour of mental exercise every day. So right there, you're dealing with an hour and a half more work than another breed. Um, they just require more time as far as uh, training, uh, they're incredibly intelligent, but if you're not the pack leader of the home, they will literally walk right over you. They're very smart. And if you, if you are not consistent in what you're doing, they will manipulate you and outsmart you. So it, it does take more time. It, as far as like, uh, 
vet and all that other kind of stuff, it's, it's the same as any other dog. Where the more time comes in, is it's the physical and the mental workouts. Are there behaviors that herding dogs exhibit that are okay in a rural, rural herding environment that may not be okay in the city? Yes, uh, herding dogs exhibit their, their DNA, you know, their trained DNA behaviors in urban environments that work in, in rural environments that don't work here. In rural environments, if they are going after, not aggressively, but going after an animal and hurting it, that's fine. You take that same dog in an urban environment and you put it in a dog park and it's exhibiting its hurting behaviors, whether it be pushing or nipping or whatever, that can be construed by other dogs as aggression, create a dog fight. So yes, there is definitely, uh, there are, their behaviors have to be modified. They have to be corrected. As soon as they start nipping, as soon as they, they start shoving, you have to correct them and let them know that that behavior is not acceptable. And that's how you keep that kind of dog in an urban environment. It's all about training. Are there any common behavioral problems that you encounter with these type of dogs? Yeah, there are a lot of common behavioral problems that come with herding dogs and working breed dogs. Um, you will find, uh, you know, they will exhibit from their specific breed, whether it's the nipping or the shoving. But what you will, the biggest thing you'll find is, is most people that get these animals don't do the proper physical and mental exercises. And what comes from that is uh, frustration, which can, can turn into chewing and destruction and aggression. It, it can it can go downhill very quickly if they're if they if their needs aren't met what are the most commonly misconstrued behaviors and how do people misconstrue them well the misconstrued behaviors are their hurting behaviors it's the nipping and the and the shoving uh, which shoving which mostly like dogs like the German shepherds do um, it's really the nipping and then like with uh, the Border Collies, they fixate, they stare, they get very fixated on one thing. And then they do low crouching predator behavior, which is people look at that and go, oh my God, this dog's aggressive. That's not actually aggression. It is actually modified aggressive prey tendencies, but are not aggressive anymore. But because they are physical or intimidating, people deem that dog aggressive even if it's not it's just exhibiting its behavior and then the owner has not modified that behavior are there any breeds that have a tendency to have ocd uh well you say ocd that's a that's a human <laughs> term but if you're talking about that's like fixation that would be the border collie they are really because they they're headers what they do is they go to the front of the pack and they stare down the sheep and then they go into a low crouch and get into a very predatory stalking behavior, which scares the sheep, which causes them to either stop or move, which is the purpose of that dog. So that, I, if you want to call it OCD, it, uh, with them, it's actually, it's called fixation. They will fixate on something. And that fixation could be a baby, which doesn't mean they're going to hurt the baby, but you will see with border collars, they will look at something and they do not take their eyes off of it and it's it can be very intimidating because humans react to predatory behavior as well we're all designed to react to predatory behavior uh what is some what is what approach does someone need to take in dealing with fixation problems well if, if you're dealing with fixation problems the second a dog starts fixating you need to correct it and if you don't have the training or the the knowledge of how to properly correct an animal, you need to hire a reputable behavioral trainer, not an obedience trainer. That is great for uh, for using other parts of their skill set, but when you're talking about behavior and you need it corrected, you need to hire an actual behavioral trainer. In your opinion, how versatile is the herding group? The herding group is really versatile. They have been used for a lot of different things from therapy dogs to service dogs, police dogs, bomb dogs, hunting dogs. Um, they're amazing at agility courses, fly ball. Uh, they, they're, what is inbred in their DNA, that can be, that skill set can be rerouted to a lot of different jobs. So it's not like you have a dog, you have, if that dog doesn't herd, it's going to go insane. You can actually reroute that skill set into other skills 
that satisfies their mental need to, to have a job and be worked out. Okay. Susan, what are the most common problems that her her urban herding dog owners come to you with? Uh, the most common problems that herding dog owners come to me with are obviously behavioral issues and those behavioral issues tend to be uh, the dogs being destructive and aggressive. Those are the higher end. On the lower end, it's just nipping and pushing children, other dogs. Uh, there can be dog aggression, but it all boils down to the dog not being properly mentally and physically satisfied so but the way they come out it, it can be it it you know it can go pretty far are herding dogs difficult to train no herding dogs are well they're very let me be clear herding dogs are very trainable because they're highly highly intelligent the caveat to that is if you don't know how to train a dog or you take your dog to a trainer that doesn't know how to deal with hurting dogs in particular because of their intelligence you will find that the dog ends up training the human because especially when you're dealing with uh the healers uh because they're very manipulative they're very intelligent they're very manipulative so easy to train uh yes as long as you know what you're doing you cannot find a more highly trainable dog but you have to know what you're doing or they will walk all over you <laughs> What goes into training a herding dog to be a good urban pet? What goes into training a herding dog? Well, you have to you have to know how to how to use their instincts in a positive way. That's the challenge. So if you don't know how to do that, you need to find somebody who knows how to do that. Again, that is generally not going to be an obedience trainer. That will be a behavioral trainer. But you have to find a way. And for each dog, it will be individual because different dogs within a breed have different personalities so you have to hone in on what works for them and find a way to reroute those amazing skills that they have to get that mental and physical exercise that they need and then they will be amazingly happy healthy loving dogs family animals in an urban environment what kind of approach does someone need to take when training a herding dog for city living well, the, the approach to training a dog with urban and city living is modifying their behavior. So when you see them using their, their herding behavior, whether it's pushing or nipping, you have to immediately correct them. That's the main thing. That's where it starts, especially when they're puppies and you have a chance when they're young, which isn't to say that dogs that are older uh, cannot be trained. That is a fallacy that's absolutely untrue. Any dog can be trained. It's just easier when they're younger. And the second you see that behavior, you have to correct it. And the second you do, they know, they learn very quickly because you're all a part of the same pack. They learn very quickly, this behavior isn't acceptable. How does someone who works full time keep a herding dog successfully? Somebody who works full time, how do they keep a, a, a herding dog successfully work? You have to be willing to walk your dog before you go to work. You have to be willing to walk your dog when you get home from work, even though you're tired. And you also have to be willing to spend an hour of day dealing with their mental training. You know, whether it's playing uh, the shell game or giving them a toy that uh, they have to figure out how to get the treat out of or uh, playing frisbee or taking them to agility training classes or playing fly ball or fetch you have to mentally engage them. So if you don't have three solid hours a day dedicated to just working with your dog, which is aside from including your dog and your family with the petting and the loving and everything, uh, if you don't have that time, don't get a dog that's a herding dog or a working breed dog because you're doing them a disservice and you will end up with a dog that you don't want because they, when they're frustrated, they will act out, and that will come in the form of destruction and aggression. It, is doggy daycare a good thing for people who work all day to have their herding dog involved in? Uh, doggy daycare can be a really great option for people that you know that work full time. Uh, it's it's not a great option for an adult dog that already has behavioral issues that at that point you need to get a trainer but if you have a puppy 
you can, that is a great way to not only socialize them with other animals because they're not highly social with other animals. And it's also a great way to socialize them with people. And they're also not highly socialized with people other than their owner because in their DNA, they grew up with one owner being the shepherd. So it is actually a great way to work them out physically, mentally, and to socialize them. However, I will say this, do your research. Do your research because there are plenty of places that are just put dogs out there and really don't watch them. So really research your places and make sure that there are always going to be knowledgeable people out there with the animals that can deal with any situation, whether it be a fight or just dominance or whatever. Just make sure you're putting your animal in a safe place when you leave them. What uh, sign should people look for uh, when they're thinking of taking their dog to a uh, doggy daycare and are looking for a good one? Well, they, if, if somebody's going to take their dog to a doggy daycare, they need to make, they need to go in, they need to do an interview with the people. Like these places like to interview the owner and find out who the dog is. But you as the owner also need to interview the place. You need to find out, okay, who works here? What are their, what are their skill capacities? How many people are out in the yard with all the dogs at the same time? Are there cameras where you can watch and see what happens in case something happens? Because a lot of places have cameras, and if they don't, I gotta tell you, I mean, I'm not, I can't say you can't trust them. Uh, it's easier to trust when you can watch and you have proof of what's been going on. You just really, really, really need to interview the place you're going to. They like to intimidate you and interview you to make you feel like, are you gonna accept my dog? Forget that. On the other hand, you need to make sure that they are fully capable of taking care of your dog when you're not around. Dogs die and get hurt in doggy daycares. It happens. I'm not saying it happens all the time. I'm saying it happens. So make sure you find a reputable daycare. Go in, interview them, ask them questions. Are there any doggy daycares you would recommend? I don't, I, no, I just, we're not doing that. Okay. <laughs> What? I, cause I just won't. And that, th see, this is why you're going to have to edit. I won't, uh, put my professional reputation tied to another business in case they do something. I don't want to be responsible for that. That has to be a, the, the responsibility of taking care of your animal has to be on the owner, which okay. means you have to go in and ask the questions. Okay. I could, even if I did recommend somebody to you, their staff could have changed. You know what I mean? Like they're, Actually, you can leave this in. Their staff could have changed since the last time I spoke to them, which means there are people there that I wouldn't recommend. There's a lot of turnover in in uh, daycare situations. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. What would you like people to know that already own a herding dog or are thinking of getting one? Okay, what I would like people to know that already own a herding dog or are thinking of getting one, let's start with already own a herding dog. I would like them to know that uh, the behavioral issues that they encounter are 100% fixable. They just need to find a good behavioral trainer that understands the, the innate DNA and instincts of, of the herding breeds and knows how to work with them. And for anybody that doesn't own one, uh, that's thinking about getting one, I would say ask yourself if you have enough time and dedication because these dogs require a lot of time and a lot of dedication to their physical workouts and their mental workouts. These are not dogs for lazy people. If you want a dog that lies around with you, this is not, it, none of these breeds are the breed to get. You have to be in it. And if you're not in it, you're gonna have a really unhappy dog. And unhappy dogs are problematic dogs. And that's not something you want. And I'd also like to say that People tend to go and get a dog, whether they're buying a dog or rescuing a dog. They, they go and get a dog that they're either attracted to a certain breed or they're like, oh, this dog loves me because it's excited. Before I would, I encourage and urge everybody before they get an animal. Like, let's say you go to a breeder or you go to a rescue and you find a dog you love. Don't adopt it that day. You need to spend a day and get online and do research about that breed 
and figure out whether you can handle that breed before you get it. Because once you bring it home, it's not going to be so cute anymore, you know? So I encourage people to be responsible and do the research and figure out what kind of dogs they can handle for their situation. Because I'd like to see a lot less dogs dumped. A lot of people go and rescue dogs and they go, oh, this dog's too much for me. And then they go and they dump it back. And it's, that's very traumatic for the animal. So I really encourage people to do their research about what their needs are and then pick a breed that way instead of going, I think this animal's cute. Like I'm obsessed with cattle dogs or I'm, a, I'm obsessed with border collies. I'm obsessed with whatever. And then going and getting that dog regardless of what their capacity is to take care of that animal. Do your research. Do your research. Okay, thank you so much, Susan, for this interview. We really appreciate your time. Very and welcome. To hear about all the knowledge you have. Again, thank you. I'm very happy to do it. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Did I? Did that?